All right, so today is the big day. It has arrived. We are here at Dick's Sporting Goods, and we are going to purchase our bikes. So hopefully they have our bikes in the color we want and the size that we need. So we're gonna film the, uh, the process, and here it goes. All right, so we're here at Dick's and uh, we have found our bikes. We still don't know if, she, if my wife is gonna be um, good with a medium or a small, so we gotta find an associate to help us. But I originally liked this black in this, this blue, but my wife said, oh, she really likes that. So I'm thinking about getting this orange. It's kind of weird because on the website, I thought they had it labeled as red, but when I walked in here, I'm like, that's not, that's not red. It's like neon orange. Huh? It's like neon orange. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of a bright bike, so, um, but anyway, those are the bikes that we're looking at, and uh, so we'll get someone over here to pull them down for us and... And hopefully price match. So what were you what were you just explaining to my wife about the gears? So with the cable on the gears, you have your shifter and you have your derailleur. There's a locking point on the derailleur and a locking point on the shifter. Right. And you have a specifically metered amount of cable. When I shift the cable, the derailleur moves. When I downshift the cable, the derailleur moves. You want those to be in tune with each other so that when you shift gears, da doom da doom da doom rather than da -doom, da -doom, da -doom, da -doom. That's now, it. now, my question is, does it make that specific noise that you just made? It will if it's out of tune. Oh, okay. Yeah. And sometimes it'll go, <laughs> shh, and that's terrible because that means stuff around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, by having it in tune, as I click through the gears, it goes up for each individual gears and it goes down in each individual gear. So, it wasn't doing that it before you're... close. We were at least an inch off, which means that... Here's the reason why. I can actually change the placement of that chain. So what are you doing by turning that little knob? I'm actually increasing and decreasing in micro amounts. The, the tension? The length of tension on the cable. So I can actually make it jump up to even the third gear if I wanted to, but I want it down on the first gear, so I drop it down. Mm-hmm. That's it. Now so I have, I have one other question. Sure. So this is an auto shift or micro shift? Micro shift is the brand. It's actually a sub company of Shimano. So this is a good brand. Oh yeah. Okay. So now all uh, shifters, right? This is a shifter. This is a derailleur. I mean a derailleur. Uh -huh. Is it going to have this option? Ninety-nine percent of the time, yes. Okay. Unless there is a specific way of doing it. Some will also include a adjustment point here. Okay. Not all do. Almost every single derailleur will have some sort of a refined adjustment. This is called a um, ferrule. The ferrule nut is designed for adjustment. Ferrule nut. F e r r e l l. Okay. Most of these terms are French. Okay. Because the French, they make the bag, they make it the best, and you always do it every time the French way. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's the theory behind being able to get those things in. So what about these knobs up front? Do they theoretically do the same thing or yes, no? It's exactly oh, they do. Right. So all you're doing is, is it's a mic. If you take a look, I'm gonna pull this out a little bit. There is a little tiny. If you want to zoom in here, mm -hmm. and right in here there is a little slide thing that's coming out. You see it as I turn it? Got it. That secondary piece right there, mm -hmm. if I turn it back, it will go further in. And all I'm doing is I'm doing this on a micro scale. Literally the amount of pull in and out maximum is probably about maybe a third of an inch, a quarter of an inch. So can we go back here and look at the actual cable itself? Here. So we wouldn't need to really mess with this we just do these micro changes. Correct. Now, ninety-nine percent of the time, when I'm doing a tune-up, mm -hmm. I never need to unplug that and reset it, which is what I just did. I unplugged the cable, got the cable length out that I needed to, so that it was fully tensioned to the points of in between these two retention nuts, locked it in place. Then, minor adjustments on this to get the tension to go in between and lock into the different positions for where the derailleur is selected on the Okay, ship. so when you said you pulled this through and locked it in mm -hmm. place, you mm -hmm. just tighten this little... Okay, That's it. got it, and got it. going to be using a four millimeter, five millimeter hex. Got it, okay. That way you can do 
with it. Same principle on the front. The only difference is I don't have a ferro nut on the front end derailleur. I do have it on the shifter nut. And so what okay. I want to do is I want to make sure that I've got the right amount of throw. Get a little bit of it just by throwing everything off here. <laughs> I'm actually slacking in the line because there was too much tension. So you're just making those micro adjustments right there. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a tiny amount, but it makes a big difference on the amount of The reason is because micro shift is a much more refined shift. There are other ones out there that are really refined, and not only are they refined on their ability to be able to shift, you can expect them to hold on to that retention. They'll actually stay in tune longer because they're a better, more specialized equipment. And that's okay. why $1,000 for a bike is going to be dealing with not a $30 shifter, but more like a $100 shifter. Those differences on the on the a build and the uh, equipment that they use, the materials that they use, the refinement of the scale of which they're using, you're paying for more. You're getting more for that. Sure. And that's what uh, basically what you're doing there. All right. So here's your your good shape. You want to bring the phone? You can actually hear it. Okay. You hear a slight hissing. Mildly out of adjustment. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use that same 5 millimeter, which is a pretty common size for most of these retention points. And I'm going to go ahead and loosen. The now, was it rubbing on something? It is. is it? Okay. So I've had it completely loose now. So now what I'm going to do is, is go ahead and spin it, and I'm going to break hard. Everything shifts up and centers relative to the rotor. Now I gently lock this into place. And theoretically, I am centered on the derailleur. I mean, on the uh, rotor. Gentle, gentle, and lock it in. Gentle, so it's not moving while you're tightening it. Basically, yes. Right here. So this is what is known as a cam static. Um, sorry. Wait for it. I need my coffee. <laughs> Uh, caliper, thank you. Uh, so this has got a cam on there. When I turn that, it actually is doing this. It's okay. going in and out. I got a pad here and a pad here. This is a static side that's forcing the rotor into the other side. So I'm pushing into it. That's what's grabbing a hold of it. And that's why disc brakes are so well functioned is because you've got a ton amount of space and surface area and you've also got holes in there, which actually allowed debris to go into. So if you got a muddy, muddy ride, and you got crap all over your bike, when you hit the brakes, dirt will go into or completely off of the rotor. When it's in there, you're getting more purchase of metal on the actual braking surface. Much That's better than the old school pads. Traditionally, because when you're riding through the dirt and the crap, you also have to squeeze the dirt and the crap in order to be able to stop. Uh. But this, it has a place for that dirt and crap to go. Now you've got metal on metal or metal on braking pad. So these holes in these slots aren't just to make them look pretty, they actually have a function. Absolutely. The secondary function of it is also to help it keep cooler. As it's spinning, it's going to go ahead and allow that wind to... Minim you're minimizing the amount of material. Less mass, you don't have to worry about heat, holding, or cold retention, any of those. So by having the materials cut, thinned out, place for the debris to go to, as well as a cooling, venting, rib, whatever you want to call it. Right. So, minor adjustment here that I need to make. So I'm moving in and out the static side of the caliper, and I'm going to readjust. So, completely floppy. Okay. Let it run so it's self-centering. Try to get the wobble out of the, the bike, and I'm going to brake. So you see the caliper move. Now I want to retain the caliper in this position as best I can by gently tightening down 
the nuts until they're basically meted up with the, the mounting bracket. Snug, snug. And when I crank it down tight, I want to move the top one, not the bottom one. Still a little bit there, not much. Now it's gone. Same the <laughs> Todd, how long have you been working on bikes? Since I started working at Dick's. Prior to that, I was a professional chef. Really? No skill in bikes whatsoever. Wow, that's that's quite of a, a jump in uh, <laughs> going from a chef to a bike tech. <laughs> yeah, maybe. One way of looking at it is is whether I'm making food or making bikes, it's all about paying attention to details. That's very true. Yes. Now, is it a how much extra do you leave? Is there like a fine... T-L-A-R. T-L-A-R. That looks about right. Okay. All right. <laughs> also known as it'll do. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know why they call them settlers? The settlers when they went out west? Because they got out there and went... <laughs> <laughs> this is a good spot. It'll do. All right. So you notice how it's rubbing? It's actually yeah. completely way off. So what we need to do to reposition the cable and the rotor, I mean the caliper. Yeah, that's under tight. Yeah, they did this is factory setting. Nobody did anything with that. And that should not even be here. I'm gonna steal this from you guys. That's okay. You can put it you can use it on another bike. Oh we're here in this. Oh no we're not. That's it's actually coming from there. You guys want to keep that on there? No. So, I'm assuming it shouldn't make that noise. No, it shouldn't. The hissing noise is... But it's also not tightened down either. So, I've got too much wobble here, so at some point it's just rubbing on there. It doesn't make a difference. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get the freedom to spin. Concentric and linearly speaking in line with the caliber. Yep. So, whenever we set a brake cable, I want a certain amount of play, and see this is all the way open to all the way closed. I'm actually mechanically, by hand, turning the closure on the, on the brake. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and find where that point is where I'm taking out the slack. And that's a practiced hand thing, I can't describe that. It's one of those... It's just kind of like know. you got a by feel? Yeah. All the way open all the way closed. You want your lever to collapse and bottom out on the uh, purchasing point on the, on the pads and the rotors at the halfway point. That's perfect grip, no, breaking. I've got the same already set up on the other side. So now I'm gonna do the same thing I did in the back, self-center the brake. And when you're tightening, you're holding the brake while you're tightening. I am doing that, yes. I need to keep sure, make sure that the rotor is not moving and to make sure that the caliper is not moving and that they are actually centered against each other. By holding that, that's self-centering. It's basically all the way closed, and now when I lock it down, when I open it up, it moves that one side, and the static side should theoretically be just going through a little quarter turn just to move it away, so it's not rubbing up against the rope. And in theory, and theories are like, oh, I can't say that on public either. <laughs> Let's just say that everyone's got one, and they all stink. <laughs> Voila. Wow. wow. Quite a yeah. Very nice. Uh, I want to make sure. Who is this bike for? Okay. Put your hand straight out in front of you like you're trying to stop a train. <sighs> now, why'd you ask her to do that, Todd? That's a great question. So, you were waiting for it. The size for a bike. Uh huh. If I put your hand straight out in front of you, the handlebars are here. That would be fantastic with the levers in line with your hands but I want your hands in line with the levers when you're sitting on the bike. So roughly a 30 degree angle. The taller the person, the sharper the angle. The shallower the person, the shallower the angle. It's also gonna be a closer thing, so it's starting to get smaller. There's a certain level, you have to just kind of adjust. This is a practice type thing, I can look at 10 seconds of that. Wow. So for me, her perfect is 
sitting right about there. And another thing I also wanted to make sure is, is if you notice the closure on the front cap, the head cap, there's a certain amount of distance here and underneath as well. These should theoretically be placed pressing in equally against the head step. They were not. Okay. I am fixing that. Because if you got too much closure on the top and not enough on the bottom, theoretically you don't have enough purchase that's going to slip around. So once again, that's a theory. So let me ask you this. What are these little ridges on the handlebar here? This, on the inside of this cap, has got another series of counter-receptive ridges that'll allow it to basically hold it in place. So it with doesn't move when you're riding? With enough tension, it locks it into place. Okay. Once again, a theory. But I've also seen that if you put too much tension where they lock it on against the top and there's not enough on the bottom, and you're pulling in a stress situation where somebody might grab a hold of the thing and kind of, mm, oh, crap, oh, one of those things, this thing will slip on you. And then, yeah. We're talking hospital visits. Wow. Not a good day. So that's why I want to make sure this is done right so that we don't have boo boos. Boo boos are not a good day. So, how do you know when the, set, when the handlebars are centered? So, there's a certain amount of uh, line here, and there's actually a certain amount of line here. The two of them together should self center. Okay. Roughly about an inch and a half on either side. And then. These are called C clips. C clips. They are shaped in the letter of a C. Uh, but the reason most mechanics call them C clips, C clips, is because they're crap. They're crap clips. I don't like them. They're garbage. They will pop off. Not when, or not if, when. So when you have them start to come off, grab yourself some zip ties and just replace them with zip ties. Really? Yeah. You will function significantly better with zip ties. Okay. I can cut off a zip tie. I can't put on a broken and missing seat clip. I hate these because they're very difficult to get aligned properly. Do you have any seat, uh, zip ties to put on or do you have to use these right now? I do have them. Unfortunately, you have seat clips. So first opportunity that Got it. you can, on your time with your materials, go and get them replaced. If I'm doing it as part of a service, I will replace it for the customer. Got it, makes sense. And these are actually in pretty good secure position, so I'm not even gonna worry about it. You are good. Uh, yeah! Wow, your pedals aren't even great now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I told you, mine fell off. They were real low, right? They were topped off. Yeah. So you'll notice, get real close in here, there's a retention collar, and then there's the actual, what's called a Presta valve. When you put air in there, it swells the inner tube. It's going to force that valve closer towards the center because I've got more increased volume. Make sure that collar is snug down, that little nut. Okay. Because what'll happen is your valve will wiggle, wiggle, wiggle as you're riding. Every time you're spinning around, it'll do that. And and a little bit of air will come out. You know, it's the micro movements will actually cause the base of it, which is nothing more than rubber cemented onto the actual tube, to actually start to give way over time. And another thing is this head, when it's all the way out or not sealed properly, will give you micro mounts as it's spinning. It's going to go not, it'll go. And then you're trying to figure out why the hell can't I keep air in my tires? <laughs> And trying to find a micro leak is like trying to find a short in electronics. That's the reason that most electronic uh, engineers end up killing themselves. <laughs> All right, this bike is actually done. Is there any other accessories that you would like to add on to it? 
kickstand, lights, locks, bags, bottle holders, helmet. You guys have helmets? We don't yet. All right. We'll go over and discuss some aspects of helmets for you because I definitely recommend them. Oh, we're definitely getting helmets for sure. Uh, kickstand? No. Yep. So you're tightening both. Both this? This is the actual valve head. This keeps okay. the air from leaking out. This is a retention nut that's going to keep the valve from wiggling around. So I can actually, once it's locked in, it just it doesn't want to move. And so you don't use a tool, it's just hand tightened. You can use a tool, but I don't. Okay. All right. I can loosen any nut with these. <laughs> okay. They call me bent wrench. <laughs> Her name is Gina. She's a good bike. She says you take care of her, she'll take care of you. Oh, so you named it? I did not. She just told me what her name is. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, boy. The bike whisperer. <laughs> All right. So the question is, uh, Todd, do you still like cooking? Oh, I love cooking. Yeah. That's part of the reasons I'm no longer a chef. Uh -huh. Because <laughs> I got to the executive level and I was not really cooking really? as much. Oh, God, yeah, I did that for 30 years. I, it started to become the thing I had to do. And I didn't want cooking to be the thing I had to do. I enjoyed it. Because then it's not fun. Nope. When this job stops being fun, I'm gone. I'm retired. I am retired right now. This is my fun job for doing no reason other than whatsoever. Yeah. Well, you're good at it, man. Well, service has been ingrained to me since the day one. It's just the nature of, I believe personally, mm -hmm. we are here to help each other in any way we possibly can. People have different skills for that. Some people have more than one. Doesn't make a difference, but if right. we're here to help each other, and we do, yeah. my God, what a wonderful place this would be. Absolutely. And that's my life philosophy. If Amen to that. Man, I'm here to help. Yep. I can continue to do that for the rest of my life. Be a good day. All right. What did I'm you say? six things on this bike so far that I don't like. Now, why did you take that tire off? Because the skewer is on backwards. The skewer is also known as the retention rod. It's actually on backwards. I want all of my adjustment points chain side. I want all of my retention points not chain side. If you consistently do that, life is good. All right, the other thing is that twitchy thing all day long because the bike's like me. <laughs> All right, so the other thing I'm looking at here is, is that these cables should not be running across the top of the chassis. <laughs> yeah, I think they just kind of like... No, 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 there's a reason for this. And once again, we're on camera, and I am in public, so I am not going to say what the culture is. But, everyone's got one, and they all stink. Some people have a whole one, and some people have a half one. Okay. This was built with a half one. Talking about asses. <laughs> we can bleep that out. Okay. Don't bleep it out. <laughs> People need to know. Alright. So this bothers me. I have a rule. It's uh -huh. a law. And anybody who works in bikes with me will absolutely define it. They know it. Yeah. Nothing leaves until it's perfect. I will do the best I can to get you perfect. But if you send out a bike like this on, from my store as a bike right. that I built. That conversation is going to go real ugly because I don't want to have a conversation later like we're having now. Uh -huh. Or worst case scenario with a parent and their child. Absolutely. Not on my watch. Yep. Not on anyone else's watch. That's why I always say nothing leaves until it's perfect. Well, so to be fair, Todd, the store where we bought this at, mm -hmm. they didn't have a tech. Mike wasn't there. I know Mike. I trained Mike. Mike's a good guy. And it's they told true. us, take it to another Dick's that had the tech, and he'll take care of you. So we came here. This is what they recommended. Yeah, we did. Yep, absolutely. I am number three guy for all of Dick's Corporation for service. Number three guy? Well, you're number one guy on our list. I'll take it. <laughs> So what I did here, this is called the cap. Okay. This is called the stem. The cap and the stem need to be retained, and they need to be 90 degree angle from here, and the uh, fork yoke. 
which is these parts right here. They actually hold the two, yoke, uh, two rods together. So I want them perpendicular to each other so that you've got a good straight ride. Okay. Also, I wanted to do the cables on the correct sides of the actual body. There's a left side and there's a right side. These seem to be in the right places in order to make sure that you're not twisting. And you go too much of a turn and you see how they start to collapse towards the chassis? Yep. If they were twisted like this, you wouldn't even be able to turn it. Right. And then we have a conversation afterwards, which I don't really have. So, this one's yours. You want me to do my hand thing? Six kilonewtons. Yeah. Six mm -hmm. kilonewtons is the amount of force that that uh, nut should be on there. I have a breaker bar that goes to and it leads, gets over to six kilonewtons. I know exactly how much it is because I've done that a thousand times. So, you want them retained right here as well. Pinch bolt. Cap does not need to be retained at six kilonewtons. It is nothing more than a topper off on where the stem actually comes up to. There's no physical strength there. Just not falling off. That's all I needed to do. That's pinch all this bolt. does. That's all this does. These pinch bolts will actually lock and hold against the top of that post. And then I want to make sure that this is set up according to the right angle. Blah, blah, blah. Now, we get into... I appreciate you uh, spending time with us, Todd. You know, uh, we're not even going to charge you extra for this, just so you know. good. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did here is, officially there's no good reason other than my OCD screaming at me. I don't like the cables being all wonkified and they need to be been massively wonkified. Front brake should be the very first and the back derailleur should be the very last. And I want these in an order. So I'm going to need to redo them slightly. Because you want it to look nice. Not only Part function, of the but look is nice. I don't want this tangle. This tangle is the problem that we're having. And I'm going to guess. Let's fix this again. We're going to do something different. I'm going to show you off off. Off off? Off off. Completely off. That's perfectly fine with me.
you know, I heard a saying, Todd, you let me know if you agree with it, but a bike that looks good, rides good. There's a lot of things that I would say is correct about that statement, but mostly uh -huh. it comes down to this. When you have a piece of equipment that is running the way that it's supposed to, everything else after that is head game, because you don't need to worry about the equipment. The equipment's done. Take that off, out of your mind. Right. Everything else is about, now I can push a little bit harder, I can go a little bit stronger, I can do the things that I wouldn't be able to do because I was worried the bike might break. Same thing with baseball players. When you got a glove that works and a bat that works, you know, everything else is head game. Right. Same with football players. We can get into the uh, don't worry about your equipment phase. Let's get on to the skills. So another thing, I'll show you what I'm doing here. See how it's, how it's coming down? Look at the bottom here. There is what's called a race face. And then in here, there's a set of bearings. And on the other side, which is this cap, is the other side of the race face. Those two race faces allow the bearings to spin around. There's a rod that comes all the way up through here, just a hollow tube, mm -hmm. and crown sets, which allow me to screw the cap on, and another set of bearings. I have bearings on the top and bearings on the bottom. I want to squish that down to where I've got enough retention to hold them in place so that they'll spin enough, it's loose enough, tight enough so they're not falling apart. Right now, it's all kinds of loose, so I snug it up. You gotta make sure that I'm not crushing the bearing cages in there. Now, if I tighten it too much, this becomes very, very hard to move. Let me see. You feel that resistance. Yes. It's too much. Sticky. You feel the difference now. Yeah. So I want to be able to capture the bearings so that they're actually not wiggling around and I've got enough retention so the equipment is actually rattling around on the off-road. Now, it seems kind of tight, like, right here. That's... Because the cable snagged. Oh, got it, got it. Which is okay. The thing I've been trying to prevent. Right. <laughs> you just snagged yourself into a situation where. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, it happens. Yeah, I bet. And that's the reason we have helmets. So we want to make sure that everybody is making sure that they're taking care of and they're protected. And I want to make sure that the equipment runs 100%. Now, what are you doing right here? You're eyeballing something. I'm eyeballing that 90 degree angle. Okay. So what I want to move is, if you want to hold the camera up here, I want to make sure that the stem set and the actual yoke set are perpendicular to each other so that th this part is in line with the wheel. Got it. That little half kind of degree off when you're riding, when you put your hand up, you'll notice it. Oh, you will absolutely yes. Notice it. Hate that. And then you're trying to compensate for stuff that really should not be compensated for if the equipment is set up properly. Now, wouldn't it be better to get that 90 degree angle set up properly with the wheel on there first? Absolutely, if you weren't as good as me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was a little self <laughs> I've no. Done this, I've done this a thousand times. Hey, you know what? Build, this is usually Todd, what you know what? It's not cockiness, it's confidence. I'll go with it. I've done this before. <laughs> And you're missing two C clips. Three, four, five. You're getting zip ties. Yes! I'm getting zip ties, you're not. Huh. Sorry, it's hard to see, but that's just the way it goes. But I mean, zip ties, we can go and grab them a big old. They're cheap. Yeah. They are way worth getting. And they'll do more than bikes. Like, how often are you really theoretically going to have to snip the. Uh, the the clips off to do anything. I mean, one and done, unless you're replacing the cables in the house. Got it. Uh, the cables occasionally will need to get replaced as long as there's not. This cable is a wound stainless steel cable. Some are going to be treated with plastics and other things like that. Mm -hmm. This is just material that's going to be in there. When you pull tension on that shifter, you are tightening it and then letting it go, tightening it and letting it go. Eventually, that thing's going to start to kind of unwind itself. The difference on the diameter of the inner tube and the actual um, cable itself is 0 0.0675 millimeters. Not a lot of room. Wow. So when that thing starts to swell because of oxidation or stress, that starts to rub. And then you've got that entire area, a pure surface area, trying to pull that cable through there. That's when things start to go, it's not working. I don't, the brakes are, the shifter, uh, 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 frustrated. Pull that thing out there, put a new one in there. As long as there's no oxidation on the inside of the cable, cable housing, that cable slides right in there. 
How often we have to replace it? I guess it depends on the a lot of variables. Yes. Yeah, there's too many different variables right. on that to be able to say, you know, definitively what it is or isn't. But my question is, Todd, is let's say you have a bike that comes in here. Uh -huh. You're trying to figure out, okay, is it something I just need to loosen the cable or or micro adjust, as you mentioned, or replace it all together? How would you know? How would I know? Just looking at it? I just, yeah, it's experience. You there's, have to... there's about 30 different things that would cause a singular object to malfunction. The efficiency of a good mechanic and the efficiency of being able to do turnover is kind of where that lands. All right. It's just a practice hand. Yeah. I apologize, ma'am. This is in the category of bad. This was one of those that if it left the store, we're probably having a very nasty conversation. So um, give me 10. I'm pretty close to done here. Okay. And I get it to you guys. Next. Just feeding these cables in because the C clips, even on the floor, they pop off. They're just they're garbage. I don't. Yeah. Know. I think one of these bags of like five thousand uh, clips will probably cost you six ten bucks over Lowe's, and you'll have literally a thousand uses. You know, um, this kind of actually works out, Todd, that mm. buying our bikes in the the way that we did, not putting together properly because we got yeah, to meet you, we got to meet you, and yeah, we got the experience from it, and we know it's done right. Things happen for a reason. I agree with that entirely. And then again, also at the same time, <laughs> total effing chaos. <laughs> you, you, I like how you looked over your shoulder. Careful, some customers aren't as cool as you. Uh huh. I agree with that for sure. Oh, see, when you snip them, you can't even, I mean, you can't even tell they're there. Snugged up. It's one of the nice things about zip ties. I love them. Definitely worth the purchase. It's like duct tape. Yeah. Zip ties and duct tape ain't nothing broke. <laughs> but this, there's a word for this. Once again, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and get that snip of the train done. The nice thing is that I've got plenty of length to be able right. to Right. Yeah, you don't have to replace the whole cable. Nope. But I am going to use as much of it as I can. snipped it because there's from the factory there would normally be a little like a, a solder bead holding everything together at the end I can kind of push it around and do whatever right when I've got this end exposed like this if I bump one little strand into the corner too much the thing will unravel and then you potentially have to replace the whole cable uh, to a maybe certain extent um, one of the wonderful things about the way that the cables are designed is they actually have a memory things about cables so I have unraveled a section of it it's just a tiny little bit of it we got some down here at the end okay good as new yep so cables have a memory to a certain extent and I probably could have taken some time and raveled that back together but not worth the time and effort Because you had plenty to work with. Oh yeah, plenty to work with. 
Now that's your crimper tool, right? This is a cable cutter, but it also has a crimper tool. Now what I do is I crimp it, and then I turn it 45 degrees and crimp it again. That cross hatch is right across the entire cable. I can't pull it off. From the factory, I can pull them off. Wow. They are garbage. So I grab another one. So is this your personal toolbox? No, unfortunately not. And going even deeper than that, everybody in the store thinks it's theirs too. Oh, that's got to be a pain point for you, man. You find and reaching for the tool that's not there? Yeah. This is me happy. <laughs> you do not want to see me unhappy. <laughs> so, crimp it, turn it 45 degrees, and crimp it again, and that little slash, not coming off. To where we were before. We are checking the tension on the great cable. So when you're putting the uh, skewer back on, all the way open and all the way closed, I want that skewer cam to pick up tension at about the halfway point. That's how I know that I've got the right amount. So all I would need to do is to go ahead and loosen it. See how it wobbles? Right. I want that skewer topped out at the bottom of the forks. So I'm pulling up in one direction, making sure that it's not wobbling in any other directions, and crimp. Check for center. And then once again, you're, hold, you, you're holding the brake down. Holding the brakes, make sure that the caliper and the rotor are centered against each other. And then I go ahead and crimp everything, lock everything down, and centered. No noise. Brake stops. And the cables are oriented the way that they're supposed to be. And I don't have to do this all day long. <laughs> oh, that looks so much nicer. And one more thing I'm going to do, because this happens only very rarely. I'm not even going to tighten up. This just keeps the bundle together, but at the same time, it's loose enough to where everything shifts around. It just keeps them from weed snags and all kinds of things. That's it. Awesome. Todd, real quick, what color do you think this bike is? This is an orange. It is titled red. Oh, you knew that. You are good, man. It's not my first time. <laughs> it's not your first rodeo? No. Yeah, we had a good laugh out of that. It's definitely not red. It's definitely not red. I've seen the red, and the red is red. It's hot. It's lipstick red. So, are you putting a lot of torque on that? I mean, how. From the point of where the actual nut snugs up, I'm turning it 90 degrees. That's 90 degrees, that's it. I don't want to go tighter than that because if somebody needs to get it off, <laughs> we'll be the man to handle it with the bent wrench. <laughs> I can move these things by hand, so I don't want to do that. Hey, perfect example of how things are not done right. Uh, probably should put that brake cable in. Take a look at the actual chain on the derailleur over here. Okay. You can see that it's on the second gear. Right. It's not supposed to be, which means that... Factory, How do you know it's not supposed to be? Because the factory settings should have that gear all the way at the end. It should be on that last gear, gear eight, I think, on this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. Okay. So let me get in here real quick and let me do some adjustment.
So if you're out on the trail, um, Todd, you need to put some air in your tire because you just like had to patch it. I mean, you don't have a fancy gauge like that saying, hey, it's 50 PSI. So how do you know? You kind of put your hands on the tires on a regular basis to kind of get an understanding of where full is. Got it. Um, anything that is firm, if you squeeze that, you can feel that is actually five pounds lower than max. It's got a firmness to it. It's got a rigidity, but at the same time, I can push my thumb into a singular spot and it's got a very minor amount of deflection. Right. We want a certain amount of deflection because too hard, you're breaking a ceramic vase. So too soft, you got a squishy balloon that doesn't have any type of lift on it. Okay, so if I were to replace these tires, different tires will require different PSI? Yes, or, it is okay. entirely dependent upon the Is tire. this on the tire? It is. It has nothing to do with the inner tube. It has everything to do with the tire. Okay, so does this say 50 PSI somewhere on the tire? Five on the side. Every, oh, it does? Every okay. single tire in the universe will have either along the bead line, which is the very, very absolute minimum that you can go with. They're usually stamped and molded on the side. It'll give you a range of PSI. Can you, also, can you show me on the tire where it says that? Oh, it's probably the black lettering, which is probably difficult to see. Very, very hard. You're going to need to find, to find some sort of a... So it's on here. Oh, yeah. It's on here somewhere. Yep. Got it. Yep. So is it always five under? Or is it no, the I usually do five under for mountain bikes. And the reason is because mountain bike pressure is usually on the lower end. Road bikes, they can go up to 125 PSI. Really? Mm -hmm. The reason is because there's such a small amount of surface area that firmness slash deflection that you're looking for needs to be massively ramped up because you don't have surface area. When you take a look at some of those big old fat bikes, they're down to like 30 pounds, like your car tires. That makes sense. Yeah. The higher, the smaller the diameter, the smaller the amount of surface area, the higher that pressure needs to be in order to hold the bike up and handle bumps. You come off a curb with a low PSI on one of those things and you bend your room, just like that. Yeah. All right, so Todd, I got a question for you because mm -hmm. we're wrapping up here. So, of course, what? Timing's <laughs> everything. <laughs> Okay, so we're out on the trail. Yep. What tools would you recommend that we have on us at all times? Very, very front of my cabinet, I've got a uh, little uh, saddle bag with a bunch of different things that are in there. It is my breakdown kit. That's the things that I would actually recommend. So if you wanted to snap some pictures of that, it's ready to go. Absolutely. Last cabinet. Okay. Oh, Amber, okay. Uh, we might change that, but. Amber, a bad name? <laughs> he wants a manly name. Oh, you can't name a bike a man. Oh, you can't? No, it's a collective Canadian sheep. You know, <laughs> no, it is tradition for a car. Uh, boat, That's true, a you're right. Absolutely. In the effeminate. The reason yep. is because the women take care of the men. Mm -hmm. Universally so. What was mine again? Yours is Gina. Gina and Amber. I don't make the names. They tell me that themselves. Well, Todd, thank you, man. I really appreciate you spreading your knowledge, and now we know our bikes are, are you set up have properly. An opportunity to understand your bike better. When you uh -huh. understand your bike better, you can go and do the things that you want to do on your bike more efficiently, more effectively, more aggressively. Yeah. And you can also go and have fun knowing that when you have that broken thing, you know why it's broken, and you know how to fix it, yeah. or at least the principle of fixing. Yeah. Thank you, Todd. Appreciate it. Anything I can help you guys with in the future, please come on by. Right on my top of my cab, just there is a business card if you guys want to grab that. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome.